Thanks, Siddhar, for the uh, opportunity to talk with your Apollo colleagues. It is my pleasure to be uh, with all of you. Um, basically, my talk is divided into certain topics like uh, instability, biomechanics, the, uh, the anatomy of the shoulder joint, and the radiology of the shoulder joint, and then ultimately the management of the instability, which could be arthroscopic or open uh, latage type of procedure. So we have multiple uh, procedures which are involved in arthroscopic shoulder management. What has changed in last 10 years in shoulder uh, instability procedure? Because we have been seeing this uh, dislocations for more than 200, 300 years, and we have realize it, how it goes and how it works as a recurrent instability or uh, there is a high recurrence rate in instability. So people started understanding this uh, bank art region long time back before invent of MRI and CT scan. And they realized that there is an avulsion fracture or avulsion of you know, the inferior glenoid labrum, that is the capsular labral junction from the glenoid and which leads to a recurrent instability and which needs to be dealt with with a proper uh, so the sports injury spectrum has changed in last uh, maybe around 30, 40 years and people are involved in more and more sports activity where they land up in some kind of uh, unawkward or unnatural position which can lead to the dislocation of glenohumeral joint. And this uh, dislocation of glenohumeral joint is very difficult to treat sometimes because this leads to bony damage and uh, this bony damage may be may not be very very uh, detrimental or may be very detrimental to the shoulder joint stability these are my disclosure no concern on agreement the history of arthroscopy of shoulder started way back in 1935 by for curiosity it went to west in 60s and 70s people started doing diagnostic and open surgery and then on 90s onward the uh, arthroscopy in shoulder joint most importantly, improved techniques and the anchor, which has led to the improved skills of the arthroscopy surgeon, led to the upsurge of shoulder arthroscopy beyond 2000. So Y2K year was a very important year for uh, the development of the shoulder arthroscopy worldwide. And that is recognized as the landmark in the shoulder arthroscopy. As said by many senior authors that anatomy is the, uh, what is required when you want to address some pathological issue. And 90% uh, anatomy and 10% common sense makes a complete orthopedic surgeon. So shoulder girdle, bony anatomy is very important to note that there are four joints, sternoclavicular joint, acromioclavicular joint, and scapulothoracic joint. If you study all these joints, then you will realize that this constitute a shoulder complex and shoulder girdle. In fact, now it's called superior suspensory ligament because it constitutes the suspension of a glenohumeral joint along with the scapula onto the thorax, uh, onto the, uh, the chest wall. The shoulder bony anatomy need to be seen as the most important biomechanical factor which gives light to the instability. If on your right, if you see there is a T over which there is a ball and the articulation of the uh, glenohumeral uh, joint is uh, compared with this T and the ball. And once you see the uh, amount of antiversion versus retroversion, which is found in glenoid, vis a -vis the humeral retroversion, then you can understand that a small rotatory force or small posterior or anterior force can lead to glenoid avulsion or glenohumeral avulsion from the socket or glenoid that can lead to a complete dislocation of the shoulder joint. So one has to understand that shoulder is not an intrinsically stable joint. It's a very, very unstable joint. And that is the reason why you have got 360 degree range of motion in shoulder joint. So you can circumvent and you can throw and you can do all kinds of shoulder uh, uh, acrobatics when you have a complete full range of motion. So there is a moment at the cost of stability, which has been uh, very, very important when you see a uh, contact athlete, especially the throwers and the contact athlete, where you require this glenohumeral stability of the glenohumeral joint. The circumferential fibrocartilage structure, which gives the depth to the glenoid, that can increase the glenoid depth almost by 30 to 50 percent. And it will give the uh, attachment to the glenohumeral ligament and bicep long head. And these three structures, that is the labrum and the bicep long head, are important, stabiliz uh, important stabilizer for anterior inferior glenohumeral or anterior superior glenohumeral stability in all excess. So there are three ligaments which are uh, middle, 
so, um, uh, the most important is the inferior, the most prominent is middle, and very least important is the superior glenohumeral And this fibrous band of the capsule, which goes from the glenoid onto the humeral head, will form a band-like structure or a hammock, which will give you complete stability. So what reinforces the articular capsule is this glenohumeral ligament, which gives a good stability. So there are superior, middle, and inferior glenohumeral, and this hammock effect, which was, is very important. On your uh, right uh, side, you can see uh, inferior band of uh, anterior band of inferior glenohumeral ligament, which gives the additional stability for the glenohumeral joint whenever we are doing the throwing uh, throwing action or 90 degree abduction with the external rotation of the glenohumeral joint. One has to understand the biomechanics of the shoulder joint because unless you understand the force couple, which is formed by the uh, anterior and posterior muscle structure, that is anteriorly subscapularis, posteriorly infraspinatal and interis minor, and this force couple will balance the glenohumeral joint in sagittal plane. What balance the glenohumeral joint in the vertical plane, that is the axial plane, is your glenoid, the pressure over the glenoid by humeral head and the rotator cuff. So even if you have a rotator cuff tear, that is massive tear, you can have an unstable shoulder. So one has to have a complete intact rotator cuff along with normal glenoid to have normal glenohumeral compression pressure. So it is a, 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 a the compression effect which is formed by the rotator cuff onto the glenoid, which pushes the humeral head onto the glenoid and stabilizes it on the glenohumeral joint. So let's understand the normal anatomy of the shoulder joint. As you enter the joint, the first structure you see is the bicep tendon. Bicep tendon is a pulley spine of the shoulder joint. Here you can see the bicep labral, that is bicep labral pulley and bicep attachment onto the supraglenoid tubercle, which is firmly fixed on the glenoid. And this uh, glenolabral complex is very, very important as far as your bicep labral instability is concerned, that is slap tears and the avulsion of biceps. Then you can see the anterior inferior, the inferior band. Here you can see very clearly the inferior band of anterior uh, glenohumeral ligament, that is inferior glenohumeral ligament, anterior band. And this creates an hammer which suspends your humeral head onto the glenoid. So although there is less of bone, there is more of soft tissue and very, very important soft tissue, which is giving the stability. This is middle glenohumeral ligament, which passes the subscap tendon at the uh, angle of 60 to 90 degree. And it's a very prominent ligament, uh, but it doesn't add to the major stability. Most important is inferior. And then you have a superior glenohumeral ligament. As you can go down, you can see the axillary pouch. You can see the glenoid and posterior glenoid. And you, you can see the uh, depth, which is created by the glenohumeral joint. And you can see the posterior band of, in, and, uh, of uh, inferior glenohumeral ligament, which gives additional stability. Then there is an attachment on the humeral side, either in the form of rotator cuff, which is very important. And you can see the bare area on, on the attachment of the humeral side. This is the small frame which you commonly see in glenohumeral joint. No, nothing to worry. You can really use your shaver and you can find out whether there is a complete fraction of the tissue or whether it needs any surgical management. So this is this completes your glenohumeral arthroscopy where you can see the undersurface of rotator cuff. You can see the bicep labral complex. You can see anterior posterior labrum, and then you have to use your instrument judiciously. So commonest instrument used are shaver machine. This is the shaver. It's an oscillating shaver. It rotates in two direction, and then you can use the radio frequency device. This is a very important instrument in shoulder arthroscopy. So this is how one can do a complete diagnostic round of the shoulder joint. So what is so fuss about this, uh, uh, the, uh, the bank art repair or arthroscopy of the shoulder? And it has been studied that gold standard by which the bank art repair or arthroscopic repair is concerned post all 2002 studies is the open repair. So open repair is still the gold standard for your anchor repair. The only problem is the pre, uh, the early rehabilitation, the early return to sports may be delayed when you do open bank heart repair. But the arthroscopic technique has evolved over a period of time and that has led to a very better results. So that is how people have shown that redislocation rate is lowering now in. Yes, yes, sir. Yeah. 
So just a yeah. minute, uh, I will just go through the clinical again because I am unable to re, uh, play it on that. I think the videos are very heavy. It's playing now. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. So this is the apprehension test. You have to do it in 90 degree of abduction and external rotation. Extreme external rotation will give a patient big apprehension about his shoulder stability. So this is one test which is a very, very gold standard in your shoulder instability examination. This is sulcus sign. As you pull the shoulder down, you can see a good sulcus created because of loss of inferior stabilizer, that is anterior inferior glenohumeral ligament, which stabilizes the shoulder at that point. And it's very important test, the sulcus sign. This predicts the more uh, grievous form of instability. And once you have a sulcus sign positive, you should think about the multidirectional instability. This is called load and shift test, which is where you can load the shoulder joint and try to find out the drawing. That is, you can literally draw the humeral head out of the glenoid and you can feel for it. You can feel the humeral head coming out of the glenoid and this is like anterior drawer of your uh, knee joint where you can draw the complete uh, the shoulder joint. One has to be very, very careful about involuntary, uh, voluntary disorder. Can you see here? The shoulder joint is completely been brought out by this patient voluntarily. And you have to be very careful when you operate or treat this patient because usually they respond well to rehab. And if you do any surgical intervention, then on very high chances that you might have land up in failure. So one has to understand that certainly uh, the shoulder instability is a multi uh, aspect instability. There are many, many factors involved in it. The muscle pattering, the trauma, the structural stability, the bony stability, and then the uh, ligamentous instability. So this is how you can uh, see the clinical examination of the shoulder joint. Now I'll, I think I can go back to my presentation. Yes, yes, please. Sorry for that because I was unable to... No, it was very nice. No problem. Okay. So uh, this was apprehension test, 90 degree. This can load and shift test. As a draw test, you can draw it out. And then you have a complete uh, involuntary dislocation of the shoulder joint. So most important investigation in orthopedics is the X-ray. And sometimes X-rays are very, very misleading. If you see very clearly in this X-rays, there is the hill sacs region. You can see it here. Can you see my cursor here? This is a big hill sacs region. And then you can see the bony erosion and the anterior inferior lesion. And you can see a complete white dense line on glenoid. Can you see it here? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. We can so see. this is the anterior dense line and similarly to have a posterior dense line. So this, is, this represents the glenoid a posterior margin and anterior margin as you can see here. Okay. And then you can see a small hill sacs here, which is... Uh, very uh, important sign of the shoulder instability. Beyond this, radiology may not give you any clues. Remember one thing, whenever you see uh, any unstable shoulder, you have to do a two-dimensional radiology. You cannot diagnose any patient on single X-ray, that is AP X-ray, because sometimes you might face a locked posterior dislocation or locked anterior dislocation, which may looks like reduced on one plane, but on the other plane, you can see it's dislocated. So radiology, sometimes the, the hill sacs lesions are visible as you can see it in X-ray. Sometimes you may not see that depends on your rotation, especially you have an external rotation of the uh, elbow joint or hand. That time you can see as has 31% predict the uh, hill sacs region onto the AP view of the shoulder joint. So this is how one can do a radiology of the shoulder joint. Most important investigation in shoulder instability is uh, MRI. And that has been a very, very, uh, uh, very, very uh, uh, important contributor to advances in the science of shoulder instability. As you can see here, the glenoid marims on the, this is the uh, subscap tendon. If you can see here, this is the bicep pulley. And you can see, Posteriorly, there is a high amount of glenoid labrum. In fact, anterior, you should see a bigger one, but there is a missing. The small amount of labrum is missing, probably the capsulolabral tear, and that is why the patient has developed hematoma 
this is the hematoma this is a natural arthrogram you don't have to inject the dye so whenever somebody says about early mri investigation versus the late mri investigations in acute dislocation i prefer for early uh, investigation of mri because this will give me a natural arthrogram where i can delineate the complete pathology as is seen and you can see on mri you can see a complete hill sacs region which is a shallow hill sac it is not a deep hill sacs long hill sacs and that can give you a more additional information on mri what has happened in last 10 to 15 years as we realize that the recurrence rate in shoulder joint is very very high in spite of very good repair and initially people neglected it so that's a, that's called the bony assess a bony loss on the glenoid as well as on the humeral head so glenoid bone loss can be assessed either by ct scan or by mri mri is not that uh, in uh, uh, invaluable because it doesn't give you a complete information about the bone but ct scan will give you a complete information on the bony lesions on the glenoid as well as on the humeral head so you can calculate the amount of hill sacs uh, uh, bone loss and you can calculate the amount of glenoid bone loss depending on that there is the formation of critical bone loss limit initially when dr ig itoi proposed proposed this idea they they said that 25% is the critical bone loss then uh, steve burkhard and stephen snyder group they came up with 20% then uh, uh, some european surgeon uh, pushed an idea of 17% bone loss is a critical bone loss and then john tokish from america that is a point uh, place that is a army base in us they proposed an idea of 13.5 bone loss percent bone loss on glenoid is the critical bone loss the, beyond this if you operate any patient you might see some kind of instability or high recurrence rate as you can see here this is a glenoid bone loss and this is a uh, the humeral head bone loss this is a critical limit of the bone loss which is seen regularly in our uh, clinical practice and this critical bone loss can be assessed by the osteotomy lines this uh, this article was published by dr ig toy from japan where they had done an osteotomy of glenoid versus intact humeral head and when they did a osteotomy which is more than 15% or 20% that time patient had a gross instability obviously this is a cadaveric study it cannot be extrapolated into the human life but yes it plays a very very important role and that is where the they uh, proposed a new concept of called off track or on track which is commonly used in clinical practice now where you can measure the glenoid track that is the uh, 83% of usual humeral head articulates with the glenoid so glenoid uh, track is formed on the humeral head where only 83% of the glenoid usually articulates with the humeral head now if your hill sacs is falling within the track then it is uh, on track if you are saying calling off track, that is going in that 83 percent is a off track so off track is a very very important lesion where you can have a recurrent dislocation rate as high as 70 to 80 percent even if you do arthroscopic very good repair so one has to understand that bone lesions play a very very important role in shoulder instability and one has to understand this then giovanni giovanni giacomo from italy he he suggested how to read the off track on track and he proposed a formula that 83% of the glenoid track that is a diameter of the glenoid minus the defect so you have to reduce the defect number defect number and the hill sacs interval that is the hill sacs lesion uh, that is the footprint of the infraspinatus to the medial border of the hill sacs is your bone breach so if you calculate with jacomo's formula you will get a glenoid track if you have a significant glenoid loss then you will have some known as recurrence of a high recurrence rate in your glenoid uh, glenohumeral stability instability severity index score was published by Pas uh, uh, pascal balu he is from france and he studied over a last period of 20 years he found out that there is a score which can predict the outcome but again this is the very very uh, uh, non objective score where you can't uh, quantify that is like hyperlaxity uh, quantification hill sacs visible quantification and uh, sports activities sometimes patient say is a leisure activity 
and suddenly lands him in competitive sports or contact sports so it's very difficult to predict but yes there is a rough guideline when you have the score less than up to 3 3 to 6 and beyond 6 beyond 6 is you should always do a bony labrum uh, bony procedure 3 to 6 see arthroscopic procedure less than 3 you should always do arthroscopic procedure so this is how one can uh, uh, see this uh, ic score what is the management of shoulder instability there are n number of paper publish in literature which says that uh, sometimes you can get away with a um, medical management or considerate line of management for your uh, shoulder instability yes there are uh, there are certain uh, studies which have shown that if you immobilize hand in external rotation you can have a normal fall back of glenoid labrum onto the glenoid but again this is commonly bathed by the synovial fluid this joint is continuously bathed and the in extravasation or intravasation of synovial fluid inside the gleno a glenoid bone margin and the labrum can lead to non healing of this labrum and this can lead to a recurrent instability or recurrent bankart lesion so one has to understand and this uh, this was published by igto again from japan where they found out that immobilizing the shoulder instability or shoulder dislocation patient in external rotation is far better than internal rotation and then devise a devise the external rotation brace which is used in certain patient not all the patient but yes it is in clinical use at certain places external rotation should be restricted for at least 3 weeks in this uh, sorry inter rotation should be restricted in this patient at least for 3 uh, to 6 week to so as to prevent what exactly is the bank in the essential region what you are going to see in your shoulder instability case so some patient has got unstable shoulder you will see this lesion onto the glenoid that is the capsulo labral junction tear then comes certain terminology that is traumatic tubs traumatic unidirectional bankart and surgery is the uh, uh, mnemonic which are developed and pub, uh, published by many authors these tubs are usually the arthroscopic findings you can see a hill sacks lesion and arthroscopy is very very sensitive because these patients are usually involved in a high contact level uh, athlete or high contact sports or unnatural sports like rugby and uh, kabaddi in those patients you can have this traumatic unidirectional instability which can be solved 100% or maybe 90% by a surgical intervention then you have certain terminology which was uh, proposed that is alpsa lesion that is anterior labral periosteal sleeve avulsion that is avulsion of glenoid glenoid labrum or gleno capsule from the anterior glenoid which falls back down and this was published by neveazer then you have hagel that is humeral avulsion of glenohumeral like you have avulsion from glenoid side now we have avulsion from the humeral side so again this can be managed arthroscopically one 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 has to have a very very high index of suspicion so how do you classify these instabilities in clinical practice one has to understand that classification of this glenohumeral joint is very very important one which is torn loose suppose you are playing unnatural For high high level contact sports like rugby, then you have a torn loose patient. Then you have born loose people who have natural laxity, and third is the got loose. That is patient who develop this natural laxity because of the profession, because of the contact sports or throwing sports which they are involved in. So one has to understand that there could be torn loose, born loose, and got loose. So let's understand each and every terminology in detail. Torn loose is basically tubs and is traumatic. Unidirectional instability is the clinical picture. Commonly, the Bankart lesion is an essential lesion which is seen in arthroscopy, and surgery is required whenever there is an instability which is recurrent, and so they can get away with a better results. What about bone loose? Bone loose or AMRI? That is a traumatic, multi-directional, bi bilateral. It is usually frequently bilateral. Rehab. They usually respond to rehabilitation program. and sometime if you require a surgical intervention the best surgical intervention is inferior capsular shift or interval closure using the rotator interval closure so voluntary dislocators are the one which you have to tackle and once you start tackling them you will realize that these are the very notorious patient which can have a very detrimental outcome so what are the procedures for voluntary dislocators you can use the capsular tuck you can use capsular rapi or you can use the radiothermy uh, diathermy device to contract the capsule which eventually 
the uh, passious uh, or uh, capacious uh, volume of the capsule is reduced then you have the terminology called got loose that is the one which is happened because of the profession it is usually a repeated micro trauma because of plastic deformation of the capsule which can lead to early presence of the bankard or hill sacks commonly seen throwers or uh, basketball players or people who are involved in high contact level activities and throwing activities like baseball cricket all these people even have something known as acquired instability over stress and sometimes surgery or many times surgery will have a better better results in this kind of instability associated lesions in instability are commonly seen the most important dynamic stabilizer of the shoulder joint is the bite tendon which is an anterior structure which is attached to the supraglenoid tubercle and can lead to a uh, instability when sometimes you cannot pick it up on your mri or clinical um, examination slap is a very very difficult entity to pick it up in fact nowadays it's a very controversial unless the slap tear is extending into the bicep labral complex or a sheath or tendon of the bicep joint uh, uh, and a bicep tendon so you can see on mri there is a avulsion of the supraglenoid tuber uh, tubercle you have a avulsion of o'brien stress is classical where you can detect the uh, liberal pathology but sometimes it is positive in in the bicep tendinitis as well as the ac joint injuries arm is flexed at 90 degree and you can do a cross arm adduction test which if it is painful positive uh, then the test is positive what are the pre operative selections for the shoulder arthroscopy uh, now to now we are going to divide our management protocol into three that is arthroscopy and open surgery in shoulder arthroscopy one has to be very very care that you are dealing with a traumatic instability and you are not dealing with a voluntary dislocator or a multi directional instability patient there should be very minimum bony lesion because maximum bony lesion you have a different modality of management now because of uh, advanced science and more and more publications we realize that when you do open procedure for maximum bone loss or bone loss beyond 25% of the glenoid discrete branch lesion usually get a better result and it is not associated generalized ligamentous laxity so as you understand the shoulder instability one has to have a patience in learning this patient so you have to learn the surgery step by step and there are uh, surgical training ladders which have been described this is one which is set up by us we have proposed this ladder one has to understand the patient positioning because i think the patient positioning and portals makes your life very easy unless you learn the how to pay, uh, set up the patient positioning as well as the portals you cannot proceed further your surgery is going to be a big mess so uh, set up your patient in proper position either big chair or lateral we'll come back to it the portal inspection and palpation you have to inspect the, the ligaments and the labrum and then try to palpate with the probe mobilization of the ligament that is because sometime it's contracted with the subscapularis muscle or tendon then you have to get it mobilized then prepare the bed with the help of the rash or you can use curate then you have to insert the anchor then you have to place the suture through the labrum and then you have to tie it over the labrum so this is the step by which you can create your instability repair in short and that is how one can proceed so commonest position which we do initially i started my arthroscopy i started with bicep that is a very very beautiful position as far as shoulder arthroscopy is concerned but not very good for the instability cases because instability you have to work from anterior and bicep working from anterior sometimes becomes very very difficult so i what i prefer nowadays is the lateral decubitus for my instability cases and sometimes the bicep position for my rotator cuff cases so it allows the good amount of traction improves the exposure and it gives you a complete 360 degree range of motion to work anterior posteriors inferiorly and superiorly so even if you have a hagel lesion or you want to do a bicep tenodesis you can do it in this position so this is a universal position which is used by more than 80% of the shoulder world shoulder surgeons worldwide so this gives a fantastically improved exposure of the glenohumeral joint vision is very very important aspect your shoulder joint if you see this video very critically how a portal placement is very important because this uh, is a key in your shoulder joint if you have a very wrong portal placement sometimes it's very difficult to get into the glenoid joint 
sometimes it's very difficult to place the anchor and sometimes it's very difficult to maneuver the shoulder joint so it is very important to have a correct portal position and the correct portal position if you understand this the round circle is the humeral head acromion and below that you have a glenoid so we have a first portal that is a universal portal the posterior portal then we have a second portal that is anterior inferior that's a working portal and anterior superior sometime you can use it as a viewing portal so these three portals are very very important as far as instability cases are concerned sometime when you're dealing with a posterior instability you might require a posterior superior portal as you can see in my clinical video this is the universal posterior portal you can see 2 cm below the posterior edge of acromion and 2 cm median so as to go absolutely parallel to the glenoid which is parallel to the floor because here the patient is in floppy lateral position and this is how you can enter the shoulder joint anterior inferior portal you can mark it uh, before surgery that is a coracoid process sometime you can go outside in sometime you can go inside out depending on your expertise and depending on your clinical acumen i i i like to prefer outside in because that gives me a complete range of motion through which i can work it can give take me as close to the coracoid process or subscap tendon where it, i can have a good inclination for my anchor insertion onto the glenoid anterior superior portal is a viewing portal because i can keep my scope in that portal and i can do work from both the portals that is anterior portal and the posterior portal so that is usually very close to the acromion and just above the uh, coracoid 1 to 2 cm near the ac joint and it usually in contact with the long head of biceps in short the anterior bankard repair is a glenohumeral inferior glenohumeral ligament tensioning so if i had to describe this repair my simple terminology is a tensioning of the ligament so this is the glenoid as you can see the front view or uh, head on view and this is how i can park my uh, um, place my anchors and this is how i have to tie it with the labrum so this is in short a very very small surgery you can do it very quickly provided you gain expertise so let's understand the uh, glenoid uh, inferior glenohumeral glino glenohumeral ligament tensioning this is how we are going to do a diagnostic round the bicep tendon is the first structure and this is the hill sacks lesion as you can see here a very small lesion which is not going off track and this can be easily converted into very good and we, as you can see here there is anteriorly glenoid is separated from the anterior inferior labrum as you can see here labrum is not completely contracted but there is a tear good enough to create instability in the glenohumeral joint as you can see i am trying to raise that uh, uh, tear i try, am trying to erase that from the anterior glenoid neck with the help of a rasp these are the sharp rasp sometimes you, you can use soft tissue elevator sometimes i don't mind extending my lesion anterior inferiorly with the help of arthroscopic knife this is arthroscopic knife which can give me a, a complete mobilization of glenohumeral joint and this is very very important because unless you mobilize and tension the hammer you cannot get a complete stability so this is how one can prepare you have to spend some time in preparing the anterior part of the glenoid and then you have to create a bed bed can be created using a rasp or you can use a curette this is the rim curette which i use in my clinical practice very regularly and i want my ligament or uh, ten uh, the capsule to sit onto the not on the cap cartilage but onto the bone because i want bony healing not the cartilage healing cartilage to ligament healing is very very poor and probably that could be a reason why you have a very high recurrence rate so this is how one should be able to see the amount of cartilage loss in fact this paper has been published by dr sanjay desai from mumbai and has been published in journal of arthroscopy this is how you create a first anchor hole you can see the inferior anchor hole this one has to be very careful you should not violate the wall so you has to use uh, always use the um, spatula or always use the sheath for your anchor placement and these are the anchor sutures which are come out so once you have anchor suture then you have to use uh, suture passing devices there are n number of suture passing devices commonly available this is my uh, one of the favorite uh, suture passing device called caspari punch the caspari punch will go through the uh, capsular labral junction or capsular labral tissue and then i can pass my sutures through that uh, shuttling device or shuttling thread 
so that i can get a better hold onto the capsule so with good amount of bone um, ca capsule capture i can get a better amount of ligament tissue onto the glenoid so once i finish passing 3 to 4 anchors i can have to just pass a knots and then fix it so once you fix it you can literally see the labrum which is being pushed onto the glenoid or glued to the glenoid as if it is a natural labrum giving a bumper effect for the glenoid or humeral head the moment you repair the glenoid labral cam complex you can see a better positioning of the humeral head onto the glenoid giving the complete stability to the glenohumeral joint now we'll speak about the posterior bankrad repair nowadays we started seeing a lot of posterior bankrad repair because of maybe a better understanding and better mri viewing so uh, a radiologist report that as a superior a posterior bankrad region the uh, the change which is happened in posterior bankrad repair is just creating our posterior superior portal you can see here a 19 year old male who is a hockey player who landed up with the bony lesion on a posterior glenoid you can see posteriorly the principle remains same as do it in the anterior glenohumeral uh, instability similarly posterior glenohumeral instability sometimes you have to go anteriorly and extend your lesion anteriorly and then fix it with the anchor release your lesion and then you can create the uh, tough you can pass your anchor one anteriorly and three posteriorly leading to a complete friction so this is the posterior bankrad repair as you can see here again the glenohumeral joint the anterior structures are very fine there is no uh, anterior ligament problems and then you can see suddenly there is a lesion which is posterior bankrad lesion there is a anterior hill sacs but it was not bothering because it's a contained defect so we have just left it as it is and then we will work on the posterior bankrad lesion arthroscopically you can use uh, different techniques sometime people prefer the open uh, repair versus arthroscopic repair Where you have to use a similar kind of devices like uh, suture. This is the rasp, or you can use the uh, tissue liberator, which is uh, uh, used by many surgeons to release this tissue from anterior inferior glenoid, and then you can rasp it. Difficult to work in this area because of lot of bleeding from the glenohumeral joint, and you have to create an additional portal because the angle at which you want to pass your anchor. can be dictated by the positions so once you pass your anchors you can use uh, different devices here you can see the uh, the portal been created the posterior portal i'm using the radio frequency device to release because the bony lesion sometimes the bony adhesions are very difficult to heal and this bony lesion need to be debrided so one has to spend some time extra time on this bony lesion debridement i'm very sure many of you must have seen such kind of procedures being done on in your institute but uh, one has to spend some time on to the glenoid whenever you want to do a repair so once you do that you have to again uh, same way like we had what we had done in anterior lesion you have to pass an anchor then that anchor you can use the similar caspari punch or you can use uh, any other suture shuttling devices direct or indirect suture shuttling devices so as to pass your anchors and the thread into the gleno on onto the glenoid so this is how this is a very long video i think i'll cut short this is the another suture shuttling device called uh, shuttler tissue shuttler or spectrum hook and you can use those spectrum hook for passing your sutures and then you have to tie it in the end so this is how one can tie it and after you tie it this is the final repair how it look like so in short you can recreate the posterior anatomy of the shoulder joint or glenohumeral joint for your shoulder repair now understanding multidirection instability is very very important because sometimes patient present with anterior instability but when you examine those patient you will realize that there is a grossly patchulous and redundant capsule which gives a multidirectional instability like type of feel and is commonly associated with the generalized laxity syndrome or marfan syndrome or mucopolysaccharidosis type of lesions or syndrome which can lead to symptomatic glenohumeral instability in more than one direction so one has to understand that multidirectional instability is completely different ball game
it the mainstay in multidistrict instability is the rehab and the rehab protocols which are designed by your physiotherapist like pendulum exercises abduction exercises strengthening exercises and rotational exercises including theraband works better what we have done in certain time is modification of our repair as you see we pass all our anchor and then start tying knots and this is how we have redistribution of anchor repaired lot onto the glenoid joint so this is a technique which is designed by me in clinical practice where i pass instead of passing uh, inferior uh, tying inferior anchor i pass all the anchors and then i start tying knots so that i can redistribute the load onto the glenoid and to each anchor equally so advantages of knotless anchor because knotless anchors are very very easy to use easy to handle and less operative time there is a more assured knot and locking and more maneuverability is required and that is why i think whole world is moving towards knotless anchors plus there is no knotek knotek is whenever you are putting a knot you are almost putting 3 4 5 throws and these throws can create a big amount of bumper which can give you a knotek in the form of glenohumeral arthritis sometimes it's very difficult to address the issue of bone instability or glenoid bone loss the best way to is to refill refill whatever is lost and this procedure has been described by wujin wolf and he has said the adjunct to the arthroscopic anterior stabilizer whenever you see a big engaging hill sac massage is defined as the arthroscopic solution to the engaging hill sacs because this is the one entity which can lead to a recurrent instability so now we have two two reasons why you have a recurrence that is one is on the glenoid side that is because of glenoid bone loss which can be addressed by the other technique that is latarge procedure on the humeral side you can do something known as ramp massage it can be done arthroscopically with a better technique so this is a paper which is published and popularized and now we use this as a most important technique whenever we see a bion so this is similar kind of lesion as you can see here the hill sacs lesion this is the posterior part of the shoulder joint and i'm trying to locate my hill sacs this is hill sacs lesion and th there you can do a tenodesis that is the application of the uh, intraspinatus tendon into the defect with the help of the anchor you can get a better checkering mechanism which will avoid and prevent your glenohumeral uh, joint dislocation so this is how i have placed my anchor and then after placing my anchor i am trying to uh, stitch my intraspinatus tendon into the uh, at, uh, the uh, hill sacs region so this is tino disease effect as you can see here this is the intraspinatus tendon sorry this is the intraspinatus tendon this is the anterior glenoid after doing labrum if i pass my intraspinatus tendon and fix it so that it creates a good checkering allow my humeral head to go down or go out of the glenoid cavity this can be done with the help of suture anchor as you can see here the biodegradable suture anchor which has been used and then you can use a suture shuttling devices where you can fix the intraspinatus tendon into the uh, the humeral head which is leading to filling effect for the uh, hill sacs lesion so take home message as far as arthroscopy is concerned the surgeon more learning curve is important this is a precise operation one has to be very very clear whenever you see a big defect one has to consult his patients for the latarge type of procedure and especially the off track you can do a remplissage type of procedure now coming to the glenoid after doing the humeral head loss we'll come back to the glenoid bone loss glenoid bone loss can be diagnosed as the uh, uh, end end face view of the glenoid sometimes it's very difficult to get, get a right end face view and one has to have a normal uh, good relation with your radiologist so as to find out amount of bone loss and that can be easily done by calculating the length of the defect which service the depth of the defect and this can be done on end face view of the glenoid for that you have to use a normal glenoid and then you can compare it with the abnormal glenoid what is latarge type of procedure whenever you have a bony uh defect on the anterior glenoid that bony defect needs to be filled with bone unless you create that bone bridge there you cannot get a complete stability and this initially was described by halfet where he wanted a bone effect so he started doing coracoid osteotomy and used conjoint tendon for fixing or coracoid for fixing that bone defect 
then came certain researchers who found out that bone defect bone effect may not be a only effect what is best effect is a sling effect so they started dividing the subscapularis tendon and going through the subscapularis tendon you fix the the, the coracoid process onto the glenoid through the subscapularis tendon which will give you much better effect that is sling effect then came the capsular effect so gil walsh group from france they started preserving the ac ligament and that ac ligament can be repaired with your remaining part of the labrum so as to give a complete stability so now we have a triple effect that is bone effect because of the coracoid bone you have sling effect because of subscapularis division and you have a capsular effect because of repairing the labrum onto the capsule so this is the original helfeld diagram which was 1950 published in 1950 and this is how one can create a bone effect onto the glenoid and this is how one can create a bone effect onto the hill sac region so now you have a engaging hill sac and you don't want your hill sac to engage so you enhance the area of glenoid anteriorly so as to prevent that engagement so in short you have to create a, a loss uh, you have to pay for the loss which is created because of a recurrent instability this is three procedures which are commonly done in our clinical practice that is arthroscopic bank cut the remplissage and uh, the um, the uh, latarge type of procedure for unstable shoulder in summary arthroscopic techniques are here to stay you have to have a good patient expectation and uh, as you perform more and more practice makes men perfect so as your fellows and resident they try to learn this technique there are more and more surgeons will start doing it improve designs and techniques and implant devices will improve the skills over the time and this is how one can master the art of arthroscopy thank you